Hi, I'm Dr. Charlene Hurst. I lead the Columbia River Management Unit for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. As we discussed in the first video, Columbia River fisheries make important contributions to Washington State. These fisheries also occur within the broader context of salmon conservation and recovery, and the needs of many different user groups. In this video, we'll walk you through the annual management cycle for non-treaty commercial and recreational fisheries. Each year, there's a lot that we need to consider. The unique life cycle of salmon and steelhead, the requirements for staying within our harvest constraints, and the need to share and coordinate management of fisheries with different user groups. Throughout this process, we prioritize conservation and aim to maximize sustainable opportunity for Columbia River fisheries within those conservation parameters. Salmon and steelhead are naturalist fish, which means they spawn in freshwater rivers, live in the ocean for a couple years, and then migrate back to the same river where they spawn to reproduce. Because of this complex life cycle, salmon and steelhead rely on multiple habitats, both in freshwater and in the ocean, interacting with different user groups along the way. For example, a salmon born in a small stream in central Washington migrates past hydroelectric dams, predators, and cargo ships on its way to the ocean, and encounters ocean fisheries and marine predators as it migrates through the Gulf of Alaska and Canadian waters before returning to the Columbia River. This fish's chance of survival is also strongly influenced by fluctuating environmental factors like floods, droughts, water temperatures, and ocean currents. Because salmon survival and reproduction vary a lot from year to year, our harvest management is designed to allocate a smaller proportion of returning salmon for harvest in years where they are less abundant and a larger proportion when they are more abundant. By adjusting harvest with abundance, we aim to protect stocks when their populations are low and offer more fishing opportunities when their stocks can support it. We call this abundance-based harvest management. This concept of abundance-based harvest would be straightforward if we only encountered one stock at a time, or if all the fish stocks in the river had the same abundance. But in reality, when we go fishing, we're likely to encounter fish from many different stocks, all with different levels of abundance. This is what we called a mixed stock fishery. In the Columbia River, we may encounter both hatchery and wild fish stocks. Hatchery programs produce salmon and steelhead to supplement wild populations and provide harvest opportunities for fisheries. There are also wild salmon and steelhead runs, which, depending on their abundance, may be targeted in the fisheries. Many of these populations are listed under the Endangered Species Act, or the ESA, and have recovery plans in place overseen by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Fishery Service, or NOAA Fisheries. Every year, NOAA Fisheries assesses stock status and establishes limits on how many of these fish can be harvested by ocean and in-river fisheries without having a significant negative impact on the population. We refer to these as allowable ESA impacts. When managing a mixed stock fishery, managers must consider the abundance-based harvest thresholds for healthy stocks, as well as the ESA impact limits for protected stocks. This means that sometimes we're constrained by the limits for protected stocks, even when we could have harvested healthy stocks at a higher rate. In this example, we have strict limits on the number of blue fish that can be harvested. And as managers, we must ensure that we don't exceed this limit. This makes blue fish the constraining stock and fisheries for pink fish and green fish must be planned around the limits on bluefish. We call this weak stock management. To accomplish this, managers utilize different tools to prioritize harvest of abundant fish populations while doing our best to avoid harvesting the fish we don't want to catch. This may include planning fisheries to occur in times and areas where we have more of the fish we want to catch and fewer of the fish we want to avoid. Other strategies include using certain gear types or fish handling methods to stay within our limits. Communities have been managing fisheries on the Columbia River for centuries. When the first Europeans arrived, they recognized that the tribes had established robust harvest frameworks, having recognized long before the arrival of the Europeans the complexities of managing salmon. As human populations have grown, we've seen increased demand for salmon, for food and recreation, while the salmon themselves have decreased because the habitats they depend on have declined dramatically due to a wide range of river uses and interests. 
By the early 20th century, managers and scientists knew we needed a conservation framework for salmon. And in the decades since, management has become more sophisticated and complex to meet our conservation and sustainability objectives. Commercial and recreational fisheries on the Columbia River also occur in a much broader context. There are many different user groups that rely upon salmon resources. Those include tribal nations in the US and Canada, and ocean and in river harvesters from Alaska to Oregon and Idaho. As a result, management for Columbia River fisheries is a complicated coastwide process of coordinating all the different managers who regulate salmon fisheries at many different times and places. This coastwide framework is essential for salmon conservation and recovery and ensuring that tribal fishing rights are upheld and respected. A core aspect of this process is working hand in hand with the Columbia River Treaty Tribes and with our state and federal partners to collaboratively manage these important resources. We've come a long way in recent years in our ability to collectively manage fisheries and learn from our mistakes. Both state and tribal managers bring skilled capacity to the management process and we've adapted to better acknowledge the unique value of wild salmon and steelhead within the ecosystem. Columbia River fisheries are managed through a science-based and dynamic annual management process. One of the key aspects of this process involves establishing harvest limits for the various stocks and allocating the available harvest through a structured framework. This framework is a stepwise process that involves many different layers. Because so many jurisdictions are involved, we work in lockstep with NOAA and our other co-managers. The first step in the process involves setting mortality limits for endangered or threatened stocks. NOAA and Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans set limits for the number of mortalities that are allowed for each protected stock. This is the number of fish that can be taken by fisheries without diminishing the survival and recovery efforts for listed species. This includes not just the fish we keep, but also the mortalities that occur on fish that are released. Because salmon spend most of their life in the ocean before returning to their home streams to spawn, they can be caught in ocean fisheries along the west coast. The Pacific Salmon Treaty is the next step to ensure a sufficient number of salmon return to their home streams and determine how the allowable harvest is allocated between the United States and Canada. Salmon stocks that are caught in the ocean also go through an annual coordination process administered by the Pacific Fishery Management Council to coordinate the allowable harvest for both ocean and inland fisheries. For Washington stocks, this means splitting the allowable take between ocean, Puget Sound, and Columbia River fisheries. For stocks that return to the Columbia River upstream at Bonneville Dam, we also have an agreement between Columbia River Treaty Tribes and the states. This agreement provides the sharing of harvestable salmon resources and limited ESA impacts between these user groups. This step is known as United States versus Oregon, which refers to the federal court case that established this framework. Next, the Oregon and Washington Fish and Wildlife Commissions have established allocations between the non-treaty commercial and recreational fishery sectors and among different commercial gear types. Most of these allocations are based on allowable ESA impacts rather than harvest. For Columbia River fisheries, there is no separate allocation for either Oregon or Washington. So the states work together to distribute the Columbia River non-treaty allocation among user groups according to the commission policies. Once we know how many fish can be harvested for healthy stocks and how many allowable ESA impacts we have for listed stocks, managers make decisions through a public process to plan fisheries within our harvest constraints. First, staff analyze forecasts and fisheries data and conduct modeling to develop a set of preliminary options for how to structure fisheries. For example, when planning recreational fisheries, Options may include different season lengths or opening dates and different bag limits. Second, staff share these options with fishery advisory bodies for feedback. In response, staff consider this input, 
conduct additional analyses and develop a staff recommendation. Third, this recommendation is presented at a public meeting where managers can ask questions of staff and gather input from agencies, tribes, and the public. Managers then decide whether to adopt the staff recommendation or adopt a different plan. As we go through this process, we're trying to maximize fishing opportunity while balancing the needs of different fisheries and staying within our harvest constraints. This planning process takes place through one of two different forums, depending on where the fish are caught. The North of Falcon process, which is administered by the Pacific Fishery Management Council and the Columbia River Compact, which is the joint state management process between Oregon and Washington. In general, Columbia River stocks that are also caught in the ocean go through North of Falcon, and fisheries for stocks caught in river go through the joint state process. Once regulations are in place and fisheries are underway, we conduct in-season monitoring to assess how fisheries are progressing relative to our limits. Based on this information, managers may need to make in-season adjustments and update fishing regulations. This occurs for in-river fisheries through the Columbia River Compact. For example, if fisheries are catching fish faster or returns are smaller, managers may need to reduce bag limits or close fisheries early to ensure we don't exceed our harvest constraints. In other instances, if we are catching fish slower or returns are bigger, managers may be able to offer additional opportunities. Once a fishery is complete, staff use the information they collected during the season to analyze how many fish of each stock were harvested in the fishery and how many fish returned to their home streams to spawn. With this information, staff conduct what's called a run reconstruction, where we update pre-season forecasts with information based on actual returns. This then informs our forecasts and kicks off the annual fisheries management cycle for the following year. As you can see, it's a complicated but well-established process that involves fishery science and management professionals, all working together to balance conservation and utilization goals. In forthcoming videos, we'll go into more detail about what this process looks like in practice and the opportunities for stakeholders and the public to provide their inputs.